All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. I'm Raf Giallo, joined by Ed Leahy and Jim McMahon this week. And we'll have Anthony Pine later on. He'll be chatting to Shane Supple. And also he'll have a bit to talk about in regards to Owen Doyle having been on a press conference with him, uh, given he's returning and signing for St. Patrick's Athletic. But before we get to that, uh, Ed and uh, Jim, first off, the FA Cup weekend, uh, plenty of interest on the Irish side of things. Uh, Maybe in terms of starting off, maybe Shane Long, Jim. Yeah, um, Shane Long, yeah, came back. Uh, we, we thought that Shane Long was, well, not quite yesterday's man, but he certainly popped up, popped up at the right moment for the, for the Saints. I mean, he certainly, what is it? Is this 14 consecutive seasons that he's played top flight football in England, I think? And I don't think, will we ever have another Irish player who will be able to achieve that fact going forward. I don't know. Hopefully Evan Ferguson will, uh, his career uh, starting out and we'll be talking about him uh, shortly. But uh, yeah, look, I mean, you have to credit to Shane Long. I mean, I thought he'd be playing championship football this season. I didn't think he'd be he'd be with the Saints, but uh, obviously he hasn't to still see something there. And um, the FA Cup, the Carabao Cup, these cup, these cup competitions are the competitions where a player like Shane Long can still be involved and uh, more importantly for him, can still get the important goals. Yeah, you mentioned Evan Ferguson there. In regards to his uh, the impact he made uh, at the weekend for Brighton when he came on against West Brom, I mean, uh, you talk about super sub things. Like, I mean, he didn't, he didn't score necessarily, but an assist and then a number of chances towards the end. And we have to remember he's just 17 as well, not long gone from having played at Bowes. Uh, just a brilliant performance, and especially, I suppose, in light of Aaron Connolly having been uh, kind of the I suppose the player that we talked about in terms of potential of Brighton maybe Ferguson in a way uh, is kind of taking that mantle especially with Connolly off at Borough yeah of course but yeah and I just funny just thinking about what, what Jim said there if there are things that bad that we're just we're hoping just for now players to be playing consecutive seasons in the Premier League you know it's I think <laughs> I don't think we're at that you know I don't think we're too bad at that stage yet but obviously a lot of Irish players play on these yo-yo clubs who are up and down from the championship. So yeah, to play consecutive seasons in the top flight is, is a great achievement, I suppose. Well, yeah, Evan Ferguson, like it was it's great to see. We've all been watching him for the last few weeks. He's been getting, you know, more and more involved with this Brighton first team. And a, and a very good Brighton team, a good football playing team with an excellent manager, a good football brain on his manager. And look, you don't get a, you don't get anywhere near a Premier League squad these days unless you have something to offer the team. Um, Evan Ferguson obviously has something to offer the team, and it's why he's now jumped ahead of Aaron Connolly in the in the pecking order, which is a remarkable achievement for somebody at his age. Credit to Bohemians. Um, people scoffed at them for throwing Ferguson in at a, as a fourteen year old in a in a, in a friendly game I think it was it Chelsea yeah it was Chelsea uh, in 2019 you know, it got it got him the it got him the coverage got the club the coverage got the player the coverage and as it, as it's turned out it, it worked out great for the player the lad's gone over there and he's made an immediate impact on the 23s league which is probably the most competitive you know underage league in in European football so to go straight into that and, and then to make his way into the first team squad and look, but you know, let's not get carried away. He came on and made a brilliant little cameo there at the weekend. Um, and he has a lot of potential. He is he's a big lad, he can play, he can be strong, he is very uh capable on the ball and will will prove a good link up player as well as a hopefully a good goal scorer. But let's not get carried away. It's not so long ago when Stephen Kenny named Troy Parrott, Aaron Connolly, and Adam Ida, Ida, in the starting lineup for an international match. We were just thinking, this is the future of the, of the national team. And now, look, all three now are probably going to struggle to get into the next uh, team. Like, you know, especially Parrot and Connolly are, have gone a bit backwards. So let's not get carried away with Ferguson. Let's enjoy where he's at at the moment and trust someone like Graham Potter to really nurture him into a, hopefully, a world class uh, operator. Um, in yeah. terms of his um, future, um, Jim, I, I mean, obviously he's made appearances on the bench uh, for Brighton in the Premier League, not actually come on yet. And he had the EFL Cup game, of course, uh, previous yeah. to that in September. 
they, he, there's a course, uh, Neil Mope and Danny Welbeck ahead of him at Brighton. Yeah. Maybe that's kind of like the perfect situation where he is dropped in just here and there uh, by Graham Potter. And then, of course, he's got the 21s to play with for Ireland, of course, at the same time as well. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a perfect situation for him. Um, but I totally agree with what Ed is saying about not getting not getting carried away, you know, with uh, with Ferguson, because, you know, obviously the three other players that he's mentioned up front for Ireland, they've two of them particularly have gone back a little bit. Yeah, Brighton, Brighton are still in the in the FA Cup as well. So there's hopefully another chance for him to be involved uh, in three weeks time at the start of February. Yeah, look, I mean, I think there's great look. There's great, great excitement. But then again, there was great excitement. I remember Aaron Connolly scoring that goal for Brighton against Spurs back in the first weekend of October 2019. And there was an equal amount of excitement as well. So I hope that Ferguson is nurtured well by Graham Potter, who is one of the best managers in the Premier League at the moment. And uh, as I said, look, he's only, what, 17 going 18. Hopefully when he's 22, 23, we're talking about him as one of the top strikers in the English Premier League playing regularly for Ireland as well. But uh, that's all that we can hope for at this moment in time. Yeah, and in terms of uh, yourself being a Sligo man, Jim, uh, Johnny yeah. Kenny, um, just off the Celtic there, brilliant season for uh, for Sligo Rovers over the over 2021, having just sort of made his day, signed his first pro contract at the start of, uh, of the year. And then quickly, I mean, at that age, at 18, when he's still doing the leaving cert as well, to score 11 league goals and then also score a, a goal in Europe. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you've made of his development, I suppose, the meteoric nature of that past year? I think, yeah, I mean, this time last year, not many, when people outside of Sligo wouldn't have heard of Johnny Kenny. I don't think he's a finished product. By far, he's not the finished product, Raf. And, and again, I think we should temper expectations. I would like to have seen him maybe spend another year in Sligo, maybe, you know, to try and develop a bit more. Uh, but definitely, look, I mean, he didn't get it off the, he didn't get it off the, the trees or lick it off the ground. I mean, his father, Johnny Senior, I remember him playing and flying down the wing for Sligo back in the mid-1990s. And he also went to Celtic. He, he was signed, uh, the Scottish Giants signed him, for, I think, for 15,000 back in the mid-90s. Didn't work out for Johnny there and came back to Ireland and played, played in the Irish League. But definitely Johnny has, Johnny Jr. definitely has potential. And I think if people remember the goal that he scored on the final day of the season against Bohemians up at the showground, that sort of one, two, one, two quick touches turn shot, goal. Uh, personally, myself, I would have rather maybe he moved to Hibernians. Maybe he, there might be a better chance of him kind of breaking into that uh, set up there in Edinburgh. Celtic are after signing, uh, they're after signing three young Japanese players there. Uh, they signed a, a player on loan from Sheffield Wednesday, or they signed a player from Sheffield Wednesday last summer, and he's gone out on loan. I assume that young Johnny's going to go out on loan, but definitely great potential. But again, in a couple of years, if he continues on that upward trajectory, you would like to think that he's playing regularly for the boys and that he can that he can make it. Definitely, the potential is there, but not yet quite the finished product. I mean, I still think there's, a, there's you know, he's like a, a piece of wood that's been carved into something really, really good, but there's still a little bit more carving and chipping still to be done. But definitely, uh, definitely a, a talent there that could hopefully realise his potential. Yeah, people, okay. people in Riverstown in in Sligo hope as well because uh, actually the town of Riverstown in Sligo or the village, I should say, I mean that's where I think a lot of the Sligo Rovers players live and have lived for the for the last number of years. So. Uh, Exciting times. Look, they got 150,000 for him. I'm sure they've got some, you know, there's various add-ons and all that. I mean, there's people like Tommy Higgins, who's the chairman of Sligo Rovers, David Rose, who's involved there. They're quite smart operators, so I'm, I'm sure they'll, they'll have engineered quite a good deal. Yeah, that's good car Good carpentry analogy there, and I know nothing about the subject. Thanks very so. much. Yeah, <laughs> we'll move yeah. On. Uh, yeah, Ed, go on. The funny, the funny thing about this time of year is, because I, I recall now 12 months ago, and obviously in January, you start looking at, you know, you're just itching for a game of live football and you start looking at pre-season games and where clubs are going and, you know, you're looking at going, we're going up to, went up to Newry one midweek freezing cold night a long time ago watching Shamrock Rovers just to see, just to see a game of ball, you know, I know a lot, of, a lot of League of Ireland fans go up north to watch a few games over the Christmas period, uh, Cliftonville and whatever. Um, but with Johnny Kenny, 
he he came on the scene last the preseason last year. His name kept coming up, and I remember saying to a few of the lads who were Sligo Rovers men on our desk, um, you know, who's this fella? Who's this fella? And sure enough, as the year progressed, he just seems to have got better and better, and his confidence has grown. And the move to Celtic, I think it's yeah, okay, it might be a little bit early, but like Celtic play enough bad teams throughout the year in various competitions that there's ample opportunity for a player to be given half an hour here, half an hour there, in, you know, against, you know, coming on to a match where maybe Celtic are two or three up, to give him a bit of vital experience. Mm. What Liam Scales has done over the last few months, he's already, you know, he's just, he's, he's taken his chance at Celtic and he looks already to have established himself in that team. And like, it would be a horrible thing to say that Celtic are a stepping stone club now at this stage, but the potential is there that beaten players know if you impress at Celtic, the Premier League will, will come knocking. Um, not that many, some players will be quite happy to stay at Celtic, but uh, it's, it is a great opportunity for the young lad. And funny enough, so you think- the comparison with him and uh, Evan Ferguson, the two lads stuck as though they're going to better their fathers. Uh, exactly. You know, it was Barry Ferguson was a very good League of Ireland player. Um, well, it's usually the other way around. Usually footballers' sons are, are spoiled brats and can't, can't kick snow off a rope, you know? Do you think it, it, it'd be better for him, like, say, for the likes of Johnny Kenny, going to Scotland rather than going to a club in League One or League Two at this point of his career? Well, I think it would have been better for him to go to Shamrock Rovers, Jim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know, it, it's it's hard. I think I, I actually think Celtic's a great, a great fit for him because a young striker can get lost in League One or League Two. Look at Troy Parrott. Um, young lads, uh, it, it can be... It can be a physical battle and it can kill your confidence getting coming up against grizzled old season centre halves and just mm. kicking lumps out of you. So someone like Kenny can go to Celtic. As I said, he can play in the games so that it, there might be no pressure. The game could be one and a half time and the manager mm. can see then how he links into the team, how he can add to the team and more importantly, how he can fine tune his goal scoring because if he can get a, a run of goals, that's you know that's that's gold in terms yeah. of the striker in this game. Yeah, and in regard to some of the other moves that have happened before we bring the interview with Shane Supple, uh, James Brown uh, moving to uh, Blackburn Rovers from Drada. Now he's moving to the essentially the under twenty three team, the reserve team. But it seems with Darrell Lenahan's injury, it's he's essentially being fast tracked into being an option on the bench uh, when they play a card of this weekend. Uh, in terms of the move, what you've made of it, um, maybe not so much from the Drada point of view yet, because I know there's a, they're not too happy about the fact that uh, they're not going, essentially they're not going to get a penny uh, for the for for his move. But in terms of what your expectations are for him, what he what he could possibly achieve there, what do you think, Ed? Well, Joe, you know the two completely different moves, two different moves, two players at different stages of the career. Like for James Brown, this really is sort of a. I wouldn't say, you know, he, he thought his dream of going to England or whatever, going playing in England was gone. But to, to move and get a club like Blackburn, who were challenging in the championship, to go over there and impress a team like that and to get signed up um, and suddenly be in a position where he could be getting straight, involved straight away in the first team, you know, in this, in this Premier League push, it's, it's a remarkable move. And it, it shows that a player of his, he's still young, but very mature, so I can imagine he really impressed him when he went over just by his manner and his approach. And, and he probably was pretty confident when he went in amongst the, the first team squad for training sessions. So, yeah, look, I think it, it's a great move for him. Um, he would have you know, got a, maybe a, a, a certainly would have got a move in the League of Ireland to a, probably a higher ranked club than Drada. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see how he gets on now in Blackburn. And if he can get in, there's a good Irish mix there in there. You know, playing alongside the potential to play alongside Daryl Adam, who's an established uh, defender in that in, the, in that unit, and he'll surely help him through it as well. But you could just see him, like you know, he, he could you could see him do well there. And you know, with a name like he's got, you can just see the lads on Soccer Saturday going, "Ooh!" Every time he, if he if he manages to get on the, on the score sheet, you know, they'll, they'll be going mad for a name like James Brown. You know. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah it's, you, you mentioned the age there, Ed, just before I uh, got you there, Jim. Um, 23, kind of going on 24, which is partially the reason why Drada aren't going to be uh, getting a penny for him. But the fact he's been over in England before, he's mentioned for trials and it never really worked out. So he's kind of hardened and obviously he's been playing men's football for such a long time now. So it's uh, that's the added benefit, I guess, that that extra experience. And it's something a lot of Irish players seem to have gained in the last while by coming back to the League of Ireland then if they need to... If another if a move comes up, uh, they tend to thrive then when they go over again. But you know what? The League of Ireland has shown over the last few seasons in particular um, the benefit it gives to young players and the, the ability it gives them to bridge the gap to seamlessly move into one of these big clubs in England. Uh, like It's a young man's league the League of Ireland, and you look at players who've come back, and it's funny, the, the own Doyle scenario could be an interesting thing because older players have come back to the league and struggled. You know, established players like Damien Duff, okay, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't uh, account for injuries and all sorts of stuff, but like, it's a young man's league, it's an energy-packed league, and it's why it's so scrutinised and so scouted from clubs across the water, because the potential is, and the value is, is, is there, and now you can bring players. Look, at, even now players 23 years old going into, into established clubs like Blackburn is a real uh, sign that what they're doing here in the League of Ireland is working. And let's hope it continues to keep the quality here. And, and you know, they're great. If they're here to the 23 now, you know, brilliant. It's going to really help the league. And Jim, just uh, another another player who's gone from Drogheda after uh, after last season. Now Killian Phillips, a bit younger at nineteen, but going to Crystal Palace, mm. which is a great move for him. He's going to be in the academy initially, but um, again, um, another sign that uh, I suppose another sign that the league is uh, focus of clubs of that caliber, whether it's oh, whether yeah. it's up in the Premier League or upper Championship. Yeah, like, I mean, Phillips, uh, he's going to hook up. He's going to the Palace. He's going to be involved with the Palace under-23 side. And uh, they're managed by uh, the former Irish underage international, Paddy McCarthy. So, like, I've, obviously, so there's, a, there's a link there. Yeah, I didn't think, Raph, maybe in, in these sort of winter months, has there ever been a year before that we've talked so much about players, you know, signing, moving from Ireland over to England. I, um, I don't think that's this has ever happened at this time of the year before. Normally, you know what I mean? So I think Ed is right. I mean, there's obviously now there seems to be a bit more of a seamless uh, conveyor belt of players moving at a certain age from uh, the League of Ireland over to England. And not just to lower league clubs, but to, you know, clubs up, up at the top end of the championship like Blackburn and uh, like um, Crystal Palace in the Premier League as well. So... You know, that could only be a good, good thing. James Brown, I'm just going back to James Brown, it's uh, it's a pity he's not playing in, he'd probably end up playing in America and then people will be saying that he's just living in America, you know, James Brown. So, so I, knew that, that, but, so I knew there was something, knew there was something there. But, uh, yeah, sorry. Do you know what the great thing about that Phillips movie is? You know, because as we've seen with the likes of Ferguson and other players, that 23s league, okay, they say, you know, he's going to be with the academy team, but if he shows... Hmm. What, he, what he's shown us last season, you know, and what his potential is and, you know, what he can bring to a team. Like, it won't be long before he's, you know, suddenly I'm in the match day squad with the Premier League side. Or, yeah. And the best thing about it is, from his point of view, I think, and why it's such a good move from his perspective, is because Palace look like they're going to be quite safe in the Premier League for hmm. next season. And they've got a great manager there. And it will give Phillips a full pre-season to get over there and really step up to the next level, impress in the Premier League surroundings and give him a real shot yeah. at being involved at the start of the new season, which I think would be a real achievable goal for someone like for someone like him. Mm. Also, Raph, as well, I know you'll be talking to Anthony about um, Owen Doyle, but Owen Doyle obviously signing for Pats. Uh, I think he's going to be... Bolton's uh, talent scout here in Ireland. So again, that shows you the you know maybe the higher regard that this league uh, is viewed uh, by uh, people by the football authority or by the football fraternity across the water as well. So it'd be interesting to see how that goes. But actually, no doubt we'll have more on that. Yeah. The one thing I will say about Owen Doyle coming back to the league is, oh, like as a Shamrock Rovers fan, 
I was, I was gutted to see Doyle leave the club uh, back mm. during the Premier League era because he is such a natural goal scorer and his finishing, he's probably, he's probably the best finisher in the league. And you saw how he scored goals everywhere he went in England. Um, he's, he just has that natural finish, you know, that placing the ball, passing the ball into the net, that sort of aspect. I just hope, mm. hope he doesn't do too well, but I hope, he, you know, I hope he shows that he still has that, you know, and, and, and that's what Pats have been missing as well. You know, what Christy Fagan gave to Pats a few years ago, that, a player, and you know what I would have said about Pats was, is that if he had come into last year's team, that could have really just given them the final, the final miss a piece of the jigsaw. But what's happened with Pats now since the end of the season means they're back in rebuild mode, and mm. it's such a shame that Doyle isn't coming into last year's team because they really could have given Shamrock Grovers a, a run for the money with a with a mm. twenty goal a, a campaign a player like Doyle in the front line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll uh, probably delve deeper uh, into the uh, Owen Doyle transfer with Anthony Pine after his interview with Shane Supple, of course, the former Ipswich and Bohemians goalkeeper. So with the uh, uh, with the, uh, the status of Queen Callagher at Liverpool and also Gavin Bazunu, um, who was out on loan at Portsmouth and that whole question over the Ireland number one in the long term. Um, Shane's expertise, obviously, as a former goalkeeper will be uh, quite interesting to hear now. So here is that interview. OK, Shane, uh, we find ourselves in a situation, an unusual situation really with Ireland, where we have two high, high class young talents competing for one position. That, that is uh, Quedan Kelleher and Gavin Mizuno. If I, if I just about to start off, can you give me your assessment, assessment on both of the lads? Uh, how good are these two players? Um, yeah, well, from what I've seen of the guys, obviously you've probably seen a lot more of Bazunu, um having been playing regularly with Ireland, but um, from what I've seen of him, I've been really impressed. Um, he looks like you know a natural. Um, technically, looks very good. Um, his handling is excellent. You know, shot stopping is a is a given on any keeper these days. So you wouldn't even need to touch on that. But obviously, we've seen what he's capable of. That unbelievable save he made last time around in, in the international matches. Um, distribution, obviously, Man City wouldn't be signing him if he wasn't comfortable with the ball at his feet. Um, and that which every obviously modern day goalkeeper. Uh, needs to have nowadays but I suppose for him because he's the youngest um, of, of all the keepers we have at the moment I suppose um, he showed massive maturity which I've been really impressed um, by him um, I would have come across him when I was playing with Bowles um, we played Rovers he didn't play I think it was just in the back end of him getting that four games in the team where he didn't concede a goal I think they they brought in um, Alan Manis at that stage so um but he was still involved on the bench and that, you know, I was quite impressed in, in obviously how he handled that again at such a young age. But yeah, I've been really impressed with him. I like him. Yeah, he'd be my kind of keeper, in fairness, uh, look at, looking at him technically, you know, how he commands his area as well. Been really imp impressed with that again for such a young guy. Um, so yeah, I think he's got a really bright future uh, going forward. Queen is maybe a little bit different. Um, different build and uh, maybe different approach um, I'm not sure if he's you know technically as strong a, a, as Gavin and uh, maybe even more so than that the handling and um, being as neat and tidy as I think Gavin is on that side of it but you know shot stopping again which is a given you know he, he's excellent at and I think the big attribute for, for Cleveland is his ability with the ball at his feet you know um, where people talk about him, how comfortable would he be out, out the pitch, pitch and he could probably sell in, you know, no problem and, and do a job outfield um, for, for Liverpool or anyone else. But again, he's been impressive. We haven't probably seen enough of, of Cuevian because, you know, he hasn't gone down alone. He's got a couple of games, obviously, recently with, with Liverpool and has played a couple of games here and there. Um, and obviously been involved the 21s previously um, where he kind of got a consistent run of games there. But um, I think we're lucky where we're at with, with the two lads there. And I think the other one is not to forget is Mark Travers who's played, you know, played the most games maybe out of all of them or, uh, uh, you know, similar to Gavin in that extent with, with Bournemouth. He's playing on a regular basis. It's probably very unlucky uh, when he came in against Serbia in that game. Um, you know, we could be having a completely different conversation now. Um, around Mark and you know him being the number one for Ireland and that but it was just unfortunate the way that worked out but I've always rated Mark since I've seen him as a young kid and I think again we're blessed to have you know the, the, those three guys um, coming through to have the best years ahead of them. 
Well, well, that's, I mean, it's a good point on Mark because maybe you can give us an idea of the, the margins and the tiny percentages at the very top level because I'd imagine consistency and temperament are kind of maybe what makes the tiny little bit of difference with Kelleher and Bazuna. They, they both seem to have a really good temperament. You know, nothing seems to phase them. Uh, as you say, Mark, uh, Travers got his chance in Serbia and, you know, it was it was a difficult night for him, but you know yeah. what, what marks what what marks out keepers because they're all excellent keepers. All three of them are yeah. incredibly talented. So so what is it that gives one a little bit of the edge over the other? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to a bit of luck as well. Um, I think Gavin's been lucky at times. He's got away with some things that maybe Mark mightn't got away with or didn't get away with in the Serbia game, um, which plays a, a massive factor. Um, and, you know, yes, he, he's done well in games, he's built on his confidence, but there's one or two things, times when he's tried to play out and probably wasn't on, probably got away with it, definitely in that Portugal game away from home, um, which could have been a completely different outlook on the game, and maybe Gavin going forward, um, Mark on the, the other side probably didn't get away with maybe some of the decisions he made, um, didn't maybe look as, as settled or as comfortable in that game um, at times. But the way I'd look at it is Mark is how he's come back from that at, at club level um, and showed, you know, the te- type of temperament he has. And, you know, unfortunately in, in goalkeeping, there's going to be times where you are the, the idiot and the clown and it's how you come back from that. Um, and that's what I've been really impressed by, by Mark, how he's come back from that. You know, he could have easily folded and, you know, dropped down the levels or, or the leagues or, or whatever, but he hasn't. He's reestablished himself in the Bournemouth team and, I think that's a brilliant sign, you know, strength of character to have, which you need as a goalkeeper. And I think they all have that uh, to an extent. I know Gavin's had maybe a couple of difficult uh, games for Portsmouth and he's come back stronger from them. Again, I think he played Ipswich last year, maybe around October, November time, didn't really have a, have a great game, um, but he's come back really strong and his, you know, performances have been excellent. Um, and now we're getting to see a bit more of Quivine. Uh, which is great, which I always wanted to see a bit more of Quibi, and I was hoping he'd get out on loan somewhere to, to see how he'd get out because, you know, he plays a certain type of way in Liverpool. How comfortable will he be down in playing a championship game or, you know, a League One um, when the type of, the style of play is a lot different, you know, at that level to what it is at a, a Premier League level where maybe you have a little bit more time and um, on the ball and, you know, it's it's playing out from the back. It's nice, it's tidy, you know. The, the lower leagues you go down you know see it's, it's a bit more robust um, and that's all I was always hoping he'd, he'd get out on own or, or get a run in the team which is obviously getting now and seeing so hopefully he can get more games under his belt whether it's at Liverpool or, or someone else in the future because he's getting to the stage now he's maybe 22 maybe coming up to or, or 22 or a little bit older than that even and he'd like to be getting a little bit more game time now um, at his age so um, but it's again we're in a great position with the guys we have there yeah, you, you've sort of answered my next question that I was going to ask you. And this is the quandary for, for Queen and Kelleher, particularly when we look at Travers and Bizzuno. Is it more beneficial for him to train alongside someone like Allison, who is arguably the best keeper in the world or one of the best keepers in the world every single day, or to go and play football in one of the, the lower divisions? Because he's, he's, he's 23 now. He was 23 in November. So kind of getting to that stage in his career that he's not a kid you know he is getting towards a more senior phase in his career yeah i think yeah to a point it's been great from the train with the likes of allison and, and the guys that are there the experience that they have and to get a an idea and understanding of what it takes you know to, to operate at that level but i think there comes a point then where the big improvements you're going to get as a young keeper is by playing games where the games actually matter, you know, and um, it's not 23's games, it's not development games, it's it's actually three points matter here on a Saturday, how do you deal with that? How do you put back-to-back games together or playing a Saturday and a Tuesday? How do you manage yourself and your, your body and um, your mental side of the game as well, which is so important um, going forward. So I think, again, the stage he's at, you know, he needs to go and play games on a regular basis now, I would say. Um, but again, that's, you know, he, he might be happy enough there. He's at a massive club, you know, and, and all that. So it does come into it from time to time, you know, and there are players, but it's usually at the latter stages of their career where they're kind of happy to be a number two or such or a number three or, or be around the Premier League team at that, at that level. But you'd, 
you'd hope as a young guy he wants to go and prove himself and and try, you know, get an opportunity to play week in, week out somewhere. Um, so yeah, I think there's a massive benefit to that. You know, you need to go and play games you now at that stage of his career. Um, he's had all the the kind of apprenticeship side of things now, I suppose, and it's uh, you'd like to see him get some more game time now to see, you know, can he do it on a consistent basis and, and prove himself. I mean, he certainly won't be moving in this window anyway. Um, no. Owen Doyle was up with the media yesterday talking about his move to St. Pat's and, and he touched on his own experience with the January window when he, he was chatting about um, he, he'd been in situations where he was on the motorway uh, on his phone on the 31st of January uh, discussing a move that would change his career, change his, you know, maybe move a couple of hundred miles from away from home where he was living, his family's situation, all that type of stuff. I don't know if you've been in that sort of situation yourself in your career. Uh, it's probably not something that fans think about too much or appreciate, like the upheaval that it causes. You know, you just think of these things like a long move as if it's a simple, straightforward thing. But have you ever experienced anything like that where it's literally like at the drop of a hat, your whole situation yeah. just changes overnight? Yeah, well, I, should, my, I would have had a couple of long periods in the January window. I would have gone to Falkirk up in Scotland um, and, and to Oldham Boat in the January window. And yeah, it's like that. I remember sitting on the bus um, going to a game at Ipswich um, and all of a sudden, you know, you're involved in that game, yes, but when you come back, you're straight on the motorway up to, to Manchester to, you know, um, be at Oldham the next day for, for training or whatever it is. So, um, But that's... You know what has to be done. You know at the, the stage I was at in my career, I wanted to get out and play. I played a number of games for the first team in Ipswich, but you know I wasn't getting in, so I, I pushed for a for a move um, and to try to get out. So um, and that's what you have to do, I suppose, to develop a career for yourself or create that that career for yourself. You have to be prepared to you know get out there and travel the country and get games under the belt and prove yourself. And, and if it's to come back to your parent company and, and play on a regular basis. And um, great if it's put yourself in the shop window to get a move, a more permanent move then at the in the summer, um, or you know, or get a get a permanent move to that club. And um, that's what you have to do no matter what stage you're at your career, but particularly as a young younger player trying to establish yourself, you know, Hardy Kane is a prime example. Like, you know, he was out on loan, you know, many times um before he kind of really established himself as the, the player that we know now. Um and a lot of keepers would do with Casper Schmeichel is no different, like you know, and for some it's a massive benefit. They appreciate it a lot more the graph that goes into it. Um and they pick up a lot and develop, you know, the mental side of the game and what it takes to be um, a top keeper week in, week out. Um, so there are massive benefits, but it's it's difficult for lads, especially that's coming for Premier League clubs where it's quite comfortable and cushy and facilities and all that. And you turn up at a League One or League Two club and it's you know, not as nice, not as comfortable. You might be getting your hot meals after training and that, or even hot showers at times. So um, it, it can be an eye-opener for some of the guys and they don't react well to it. Um, but there's definitely massive benefits, I think, to players getting out and alone and getting that game time where it really matters on a, on a Saturday. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, no, no doubt over the next couple of weeks, there'll be the usual transfer frenzy and every day the rumour mill will be swirling. Um, and of course, in the League of Ireland too, um, you know, we're a month away or less than a month away from the new season. Lots of changes, managerial changes, uh, changing the personnel, and, and at least again in your old club, uh, Bohemians, where Pete Long, you know, he's, he's proven time and again that he's able to consistently just roll the punches in terms of losing important players and key players and finding good new young players to fill the void. If you, if you, this winter, the you know, balls have lost, Keith Ward, Keith Buckley, Ross Tierney. Um, how do you assess balls then for 2022 or, or what do you what's your sort of hopes or are you optimistic about the new season um, I'd like yeah I think we, we kind of need a, f- a few more signings in the door definitely to, to bolster the squad it's difficult with I suppose the clubs you're competing with at the moment and maybe the lack of players available on the market here you know we have hemorrhaged a good few players not just bowls but in the league in general across the water and uh, and further afield um, and that's maybe a sign of what's to come in the future you know so what is our league going to look like down the line is it going to be a, a league that's a lot younger is it going to be a league that has a lot more foreign players maybe coming into it because we are losing that maybe that's as a result of Brexit and not being able to take players 
as early, or maybe it's as a result of the leagues here and the national leagues and underage level, you know, getting players, you know, better quality training and getting them into first teams a bit earlier. So clubs are, you know, more prepared maybe to, to take a chance and because they have X amount of first team games under their belt now. So I think it's, it might be a little bit of an issue for our league going forward that we're going to lose a lot of players um, on a regular basis because of that, because of the opportunities that's afforded to them here. Um, but from Bo's perspective, yeah, you think we, there's a couple of signs that are needed there. Um, but again, I'm not sure where they're coming from because I don't think there's anyone really that's that's available here anymore um, in, in the league. I think you're looking outside of of our league, definitely, and possibly outside of the country and into into other countries in Europe or, or that. So it's going to be interesting to, to see what happens. I think some other clubs are in similar boats, maybe like the Sligo and that, Dundalk maybe to an extent. I know they have a couple of signings recently, two Welsh lads, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's utilising the network um, outside of this country, I think, uh, going forward is going to, uh, going to be a big thing for a lot of clubs. So it will be interesting and doesn't always necessarily work. Um, you know, lads coming in from the UK or that, but um, there's been a couple of successes, I think, with Pats and Maddie Smith and Bowles with Burt and, and Coote um, and maybe one or two others across the, the league as well. So it'll be interesting to see. Did you attend the cup final at the Aviva? I did, yeah. Yeah. Very disappointed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was a tough day for Bowles, wasn't it? But, you know, it's, it's kind of felt after that game as well. It was a crossroads in terms of some of the guys who've since moved on. And so that's the challenge, isn't it, this year? Like, how do you react to that? Is there a hangover or is it something that spurs everybody on to, to get back there and get themselves over the line? Yeah, you hope it would be something that spurred them on. Again, you said you lost, the, you know, some key players or, you know, key heads in the dressing room. Um, you know, some of them, like said, Wardy wasn't playing week in, week out, you know, Keith a lot in and you know the volume of games that was expected of him to play and a couple of injuries and that so you struggled but yeah it's it's going to be it's a new enough squad there to an extent and you'd hopefully like to you know James Paul Kieran Kelly and you know Andy Lyons and um, a few of the other guys will, will still have the, the hunger to, to get back and compete again and, and I believe that'd be the case you know Keith is excellent as you said at, at you know developing new squad, squads and bring them together year on year so um, but I do think this year is going to be a bit more challenging looking at, you know, the availability of, of players on the market out there. So it, it will be interesting to see and like expectations, I think, from where they were previously to, to this year might have to, to kind of change a little bit for the fans and that, um, you know, you'd hope to be in, the, in competing for, you know, place in Europe, third or fourth place, whatever it might be. But I think... Yeah, that's maybe as most as we can expect this year, you know, to be competing against Rovers. It's going to be very difficult with, you know, the talent they have and the budget they have in their squad and obviously finishing 15 points ahead of Pats last year. So, you know, it's going to be tricky. So I think expectations need to be managed on that front as well. Yeah, well, we, we hope for uh, more of a, a tighter race this year. It does look potentially like it's, it could be more open with Pats and Derry particularly. Derry, yeah. Before. Uh, and we look yeah. forward to that, and, and we look forward to the the Irish goalkeeping battle, which I think is going to rumble for a good few years yet. So, um, Shane, listen, thanks a million for your time. It was great to chat to you. Thanks again. No problem, Andy. Cheers. Thank you. All right, that was former Ipswich and Bohemians goalkeeper Shane Stuckle speaking to Anthony, and Anthony uh, is here now. Obviously, the sun outside obviously has uh, kind of disappeared compared to uh, the earlier chat we were having with uh, Jim and Ed. But um, one point Shane was um, was uh, was making in regard to the Ireland goalkeeper situation that I think maybe does kind of get lost is Mark Travers, who is regarded as the number three in this debate, but having been pretty much the first of the, of these three goalkeepers to have really made a mark. And I think I recall um, him making his debut at least Premier League level against uh, Spurs and having a really great game, but maybe he just seems to have uh, kind of fallen down that pecking order, uh, both from the media point of view and um, in reality within the squad. Yeah, and it's, it's funny, you know, you could argue that, I mean, you could make a strong case that Mark Travers is having the best domestic campaign out of the three of them. He's, he's playing with a very good championship side. He's playing really well with a good championship side in Bournemouth as well. And look, if you go back, Raph, over the last 12 months and look at interviews Stephen Kenny has done when he is discussing uh, Gavin Bazumu and Quinton Keller, he always makes the point to, to mention Mark Trevor, Travers. He's really, really highly rated. 
Um, and, and not just Stephen Kenny, actually, other players have come out unprompted uh, on occasions and said, look, you know, don't forget about Mark Travers. This guy is really good. A lot of it is just luck. Sometimes you just need a break. You need, you need a little break. And he went in that game in Serbia. He went into that game and um, he didn't have a great game that night. But that doesn't define a career. You know, Travers is 22 years old. He's a year younger than Kelleher, for example. And he's playing every week. You know, he, he this time next year, Travers could be an established or a, a, a goalkeeper playing regularly in the Premier League. Um, and at that point, do you go, you know, if Cueven Keller is still sitting on the bench at Liverpool, who's making better progress? Um, if Gavin Mazzunu is still playing at Portsmouth in League One, who's making better progress? So you never know how the landscape might change here with those three keepers. I think the only thing we can say for sure is that we've got Ireland have three excellent young goalkeepers. I think we've all, always been pretty well stocked with goalkeepers over the years and had some brilliant ones. But three of a similar age profile uh, to, to all come along at once, is um, it is unique, I think. Yeah, and also Owen Doyle, who um, um, Shane kind of uh, discussed a little bit there as well. Of course, you were on the press conference call with uh, with Doyle and uh, his St. Pat's manager, Tim Clancy. Um, it was kind of interesting given the uh, just how potent and prolific he has been at League Two level and wherever he's been really, um, that he's chosen to come back now where in his own world he still feels he can provide some value to Pats uh, going forward over the next three years of the deal. And also I, I think he kind of jokingly said, like obviously he doesn't want to be here playing kind of half dead. Yeah, I mean, he, he did say that, I guess, tongue in cheek, but I don't know. I think he, he meant that as well. I mean, he's 33 now on Doyle and a lot of miles on the clock. Obviously, he's he's had a great career in England. He's he's forged a really good career in, in the lower divisions. But as a striker who scores goals, like he's he's always been highly uh, valued and highly sought at that kind of level, League One, League Two level. Uh, he he was kind of talking as well about the January transfer window and his own experiences because very often he's the type of guy that clubs would be scrambling to get. You know, you can imagine a club if you're in a bit of trouble either trying to stay up or, you know, let's say a League One team trying to stay up or a League Two side trying to, to go up. He's the type of player that clubs would love because he scores goals, you know, and, and it's it's rare at any level to have a guy who consistently can do that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's a great signing for Pats and, and it's going to be very interesting to see what kind of impact Owen Doyle can have. I would expect that he'll have a considerable impact in the Premier Division. He, he's quality. He's still in really good shape. Um, and this is just a move, I think, for him that makes sense, probably on a personal level as well. He, he has a business uh, with his wife, I think, in Dublin, a, a childcare business here. And he, he has talked about, you know, the importance of being closer to the business and, and on the ground back here. And, uh, I think it was just the right time for him uh, to come home. Um, and okay, he's he's thirty three, but thirty three is you know it's not forty three. He's in he's a very good nick. He would have looked after himself really over the years. Um, and when you look at the type of talent that St Patrick's Athletic already have, it's it's pretty exciting. You know, Tim Clancy's brought in Mark Doyle, which has gone under the radar a bit, but he he was excellent for draw the last year. Plus the likes of Chris Forrester. Um, they could be. I mean, they they already they're, they're a really nice team to watch anyway, St. Pat's. But they could be the team to watch this year, just in, in terms of being easy on the eye and the attack and talent that they have now. Yeah, and the other thing off the pitch, of course, there's the Bolton connection where he's just coming from, and he has suggested, of course, that he's gonna have a bit of a scouting role, not necessarily in terms of players at Pat's, but just across uh, the the Irish kind of divisions and uh, I guess at youth level as well. So that's kind of interesting as well with what we were talking about earlier in the show or in the in the podcast in regard to this league being viewed in a, a, quite a high level over um, over in the UK. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the way he spoke about it yesterday, it sounded pretty casual. You know, he's left Bolton on really good terms. And I think that, you know, they just kept the link open there. He, he might, you know, the way he described it was like, keep an eye out for any good young players and, and stay in touch with the manager there and the, and the people at Bolton. So you never know. It could, that, that could develop into something more substantial when Owen Doyle finishes playing. You know, he, he could become a, a scout in, in a more uh, meaningful way or in a longer term way uh, based here. We don't know. But for sure, yeah, I mean, look, at the, with Brexit as well, 
young Irish players have to stay here longer. They have to stay here till they're 18. Uh, and it means that they're playing in a, in a competitive first team league here at a that developmental stage. You know, there, there's the benefits of playing that kind of football as opposed to the sort of incubated reserve team football and under 18, under 19 football. It just isn't the same. It really isn't. Um, and there's a lot of good players in the Premier Division. Um, we still don't know how it's going to pan out, Raf. I mean, there's potential pros, obviously, and, and maybe potential cons in terms of how well prepared are the League of Ireland clubs to be able to nurture these kind of talents. They don't have the resources that teams in England do. But uh, the fact that we're going to hold on to some really good players for a little bit longer, you'd think that there's there could be a really good benefit to, to, to League of Ireland football here. Yeah, we'll see how that plays out over in the long term anyway. But uh, Anthony, thanks a billion for uh, coming on this week and uh, good stuff on the interview with Shane Supple. Uh, That's it for this week's podcast. We'll be back next week and uh, hopefully speaking to Ireland goalkeeper Courtney Brosnan. So there's that to look forward to. But anyway, uh, best luck and enjoy your weekends. (laughs) 